you hate the thought of working past 55 or 60? Do you hate not being able to live the life you deserve today? Do you hate not knowing what your financial future looks like? It's time to stop doing what you hate. Here's your host, Mr. Harold Green. Hello, everyone. This is Harold Green of Breaktree Financial Group, and it is time to stop doing what you hate. How's everybody <laughs> doing today? And, you know, I hope you are having a fantastic day. I'm doing really well today. I have a special guest in the studio with me. His name is Adam. And I swear, man, I forgot how to pronounce his last name. So I'm going to try three times. <laughs> and I'm going to say Kosh is the first one. Kosh nope. is the first one. Kush. Strike one. Strike two. And then Kos. <laughs> Strike three. You got real close in the last one. Kos. Like Kosh. Like Kosh. Kosh. Dill like Kosh. Yeah. Like everything Kosh is Kosh. Or dill pickles. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm glad to have Adam in the studio today, and I want to go back and talk about my mission again, and that's basically to help the middle class, whether you're in the upper middle class, the lower middle class, or the middle, middle class, whatever that means. And, you know, there's a lot of wealthy people out there. There's also a lot of poor people out there, but, you know, there's a spot where, you know, you get to a certain point in life and a couple of different things can happen. You can either excel and move to the next level or or you can be trapped. And so today, Adam and I are going to have a really cool conversation about the things that you can do to excel and move from where you are today to where you really want to be. And um, so are you guys ready? Are you ready? One, two, three, let's get it. Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you the invitation. You I'm welcome, man. Let everybody know where you at. Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so since so, uh, I grew up in the, the Cleveland area and I'm a diehard, very, very sad Browns fan. I kind of oh. stay that way. Oh. But um, also an uh, Ohio State alum. So I guess we kind of find some balance there. And uh, Buckeye fans, we think we're supposed to win every game every year. So there's, uh, there's of course, that side of the equation too. But but yeah, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Dublin specifically is where we live. Uh, not Dublin, Ireland, but Dublin, Ohio. And uh 21, 21 and a half years in, in the financial uh, advisory world so far. And so having fun I, still. You know, why did you become a fiduciary advisor, plan or strategist? I know you wear a lot of different hats, but why did you decide to go this route? There's, I mean, you're a pretty smart dude. You could have done anything, probably electrical engineer, like NASA rocket scientist. Like, I don't know about that, but uh, I, w- I was in school to be uh, to, for, for med school. I was pre-med. That was the plan th- the whole time, and it didn't work out that way. Long, long, long story that's too long for this episode. But at, at the end of the day, my senior year after finishing all the pre-med prereqs, I just decided it was – I just didn't want to go to school for another seven years, but I wanted to do something else. So, you know, my uh, my dad introduced me to his financial advisor. I uh, talked to him a couple times. I came back to Columbus, watched a seminar, and the next thing you know, it was like, you know what? If I could figure out a way that I could perform or at least diagnose problems in people's lives, financial problems, and perform financial surgery as opposed to trauma surgery, that would be similar. And I fell in love with it really, really quickly. I mean, right off right off the bat, it's just, I mean, didn't take long before I started saying things like, I haven't worked in a year, I haven't worked in five years, and now it's, I haven't worked in 21 and a half years, so... What I love, I'd say the reason why I started the the whole fiduciary side of the the equation here is because, I don't know, I guess we were already doing things that way. We were already acting as fiduciaries before we were fiduciaries, but um, we wanted to be able to climb out to the top of the mountain and say that, you know, you know we're the ones that are going to take good care of you regardless of whether we have, we're, whether we're implementing your financial plan and investing 100% of your money in large cap stocks or the Swedish Krona, you know, it didn't make a difference. Gotcha. You know, we're talking about the middle class and and some of the things that the middle class families go through. And I'm I'm gonna put this one out there right at the top. I mean, this is this is a big one, and I'm gonna put it right out there, like right now. As a fiduciary, our our job is to do what's in the absolute best interest of the client, whether they either believe us or not, or they understand us or not. Like, for example, this last past year, the 2022 market. I'm sure you had a couple of people call you and just tell you some things that, you know, made your skin crawl or whatnot. And if you if you didn't have them, congratulations, because I know I had a couple here and there. There's always a couple. Yeah, but when they it's always a couple, right? But when they call you and they say these things to you and, you know, you have this great plan put in place, you know, and um, you, you've done the surgery, they healed up nicely and. And now they call you back and they want to go and, and wreck themselves up again. Like, what what do you say to them to prevent them from making decisions that you know good and well it's not going to help them get to where they need to be? 
I always say the number one reason why financial plans fail or retirement plans fail is because the client abandons the plan. And the number one reason why the client abandons their plan is because the volatility of the markets becomes too much for them and they throw their hands up and they they quit. They can't they okay. can't take it anymore. And okay. to me, the number one di- the number one diagnosis for that problem is that the portfolio is too aggressive. Okay. And maybe they didn't know it. I mean, it's kind of funny. It's like if you use, you know, speed limits as an analogy for risk. If the market's going up like 2017, one of the lowest volatility years in the history of the markets, right? And you do it, and you do an analysis. Uh, let's just say a just quick psychoanalysis of a client and how much risk they're comfortable taking. They're going to tell you, "I drive my car at 75." You do it in the middle of 2022, they're going to say it's 45. Right. So it just depends on what the markets are doing. So it's. I think it's the hardest part is trying to figure out with everybody you're sitting across the table from how can they handle risk in the worst times, and if you can if you can manage to the worst times. Then the rest will take care of itself. I think. Gotcha. So that's the question, though. Why is it? Why do you think it's such a moving target with some people? And I've heard someone say this the other day that maybe they just really don't know what they want. Mm. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they want, and is constantly changing or evolving. So how do you how do you handle that? Me personally, and I don't know if this is really the answer you want, what you're looking for, but me personally, it comes down to a written plan. Okay. You know, I, if I believe. I was just sharing a statistic with somebody uh, out of San Francisco, uh, 6.6% of financial advisory firms reported that they do uh, proactive advanced financial planning. Wow. And, and that's a very, very small number. That is. Some of that's because people don't want to pay for it. Okay. Some of it's because the firms just don't do it. And that's the bigger number. Most firms, most, when I say most, I don't mean, you know, 95%. I mean, a majority, meaning more than half of firms don't implement financial planning, retirement planning projections. So I think that um, what you're doing, if you don't have a plan in place, a written plan is you're hoping you make it. And I think that when you are in the middle of a bear market, or even if it's just your run of the mill, 14% annual correction, and you're freaking out as a client, if you have a plan and you can then pull up that plan and go, okay, it's fine. We're okay. Then there's nothing to freak out about. But if you don't have a plan and your your plan is hope, that's the strategy, then I think it's going to be pretty tough to really to answer any client's questions because you really don't know how. Like if I'm trying to get across the country from Columbus to Hawaii Mm -hmm. um, and and my plan is drive west and swim, I mean, I'm not sure if that's the best advice in the world, you know? So I I know it sounds maybe cliche, but I think that at the end of the day, everyone, even people who have absurd amounts of money, but especially the middle class, uh, needs to have a plan in place because we got to know where we're going in order to determine how we're going to invest our money. You know, I totally agree with you on that. Every single client that's a client of mine that's in my money management system has a plan that every time they call me and we do a review or whatever, we update something, my assistant sends out that plan for them to DocuSign. That's awesome. That's awesome. Their plans are DocuSign every single time they make changes. So no one can tell me that I haven't done a plan for them because it's automatically updated and sent to them and they have it on record. But to your point, a lot of people fail to look at their plans just like they fail to look at the map because they think they know where they're going. Mm -hmm. Well, and some of it's just fear. You know, I mean, I I always joke that if Marcus just went straight up, I wouldn't have a job. So exactly. (laughs) And and then and when when a client calls in with a question or they're upset or concerned or fearful at the end of the day, we always say they just don't they don't understand. And it's our job to help them understand. It's our job to educate them. Right. And if it's not okay, we need to make it okay. Like and you mentioned earlier, the whole risk issue or the markets, you know, are are freaking them out and things are down maybe more than than they'd like them to be. Well, what that tells me is maybe we didn't we got it off where we were off a little bit in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we thought we were right. When we sat down together, you know, you and the client or clients and said, we we drive our car at, at 70 and we're a moderate growth investor. But at the end of the day, maybe we're actually a solid right in the smack dab in the middle balanced investor. Maybe we were just wrong. We thought we were right. We were wrong. Change right. it. Right. Now, we're getting into some real deep psychological stuff. And I think, you know, if I could call you Dr. Adam, that'd be awesome. <laughs> but here's the deal. And, and I want you to help me diagnose this because this is insane. A lot of people talk about their financial situation either in a good way or in a bad way. I'll give you an example. You're at your boy's house and you know they're talking to you about like this hot stock tip that they got, and you know, they're all like happy about it and they made so much money about it. Or then someone comes to you and say, you know, they give you something negative, they throw something bad at you. 
And my question is, is why when people get together, they have a tendency to do this like one upmanship, you know, with their with their portfolios and then, you know, like want to change something just because somebody said at a party. I used to stand up in front of my workshops when I did public speaking and say, the worst thing you guys can do is go talk to your neighbors about what you're trying to do and how to solve your problems. That's the worst thing you can do. Go talking to your family because if they have no responsibility and no skin in the game, how do you know they're going to tell you what's in your absolute best interest? So how do you help your clients and, and condition your people to stay away from that bull that they hear at parties and you know, stay away from one-upmanship and just like keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, stay the course? I think some people are really private and, and that's not going to be a problem to begin gotcha. with. I think that I think some people are going to be they don't know that they're going to go talk about it at a party until they do. And then they do. And then it becomes, I don't want to call it a problem, mm -hmm. but it comes back to you. And I think that's where I say, I would say, what's the next most important thing to your health? Probably your money. Some might argue your religion mm -hmm. is first, right? Yeah. But money is top three, I'd argue. Uh, right. and, and I can't think of anything else that's, that's more important. So with that being said, with your, if your health is close to being as important as your money, because obviously you can't spend it if you're not healthy, right. or if you're gone, if you're dead, you can't spend it either. I would say that if you if you need surgery, would you ask your neighbor what they think about whether or not you need your gallbladder removed? If you need if you have diverticulitis and you need a partial colon resection, are you going to go ask your friend down the street or your or your your longtime friend at church, what, you know, do they, do they think they could do what's, what would they do if you, if they were you. Right. And worse yet, because you've heard this, I know you have, I want to buy this stock Harold, because uh, this friend of mine I was talking to on the way on the subway on the way to work said it was this great thing and he bought it and it's made all this money. So can you, can you buy this stock for me? It's like, well, I mean, I, I don't know how women think, but I, I heard a mentor of mine once say that Men will spend hours and hours researching how much they're going to spend on a five hundred dollar lawnmower, right? But then they'll go spend five thousand dollars on a stock that they overheard someone else talking about at a table next to him at a restaurant. That's insane, so, dude. Yeah, I mean, you just I think I think that if when the time comes that you have that that hey, well, my friend said this, or my you know I was talking to him, to my dad, and he manages his his portfolio his whole life, mm -hmm. so he's an expert. And it's right. like, well, is he? I mean, because it's kind of like Vegas, you know. I hate to use gambling analogies and when when talking about this stuff, but there's just no, so many that it. work. Go when you it. go to Vegas, everybody's excited, right? Yep. People are on the plane, they're dancing, they're they're shouting, they're they're having a great time. On the way back, it's quiet, isn't it? Mm -hmm. On the way back, it's quiet, except for that one or two people that won some money. So, I mean, it's it's not all that different. You know, the person who is going to give you all kinds of advice is only going to tell you about their wins. They're not going to talk about their losses. Hey, I got to say this. <laughs> Every time I go out to your neck of the woods and I come back to Hawaii and I see <laughs> the people on the plane, it's the same thing. Everybody's excited. I can barely get any freaking sleep because the kids are all excited. The parents are excited. We're going to Hawaii. You know, I'm like, God, <laughs> dog, man, like, please. But then you're just going home, you know, <laughs> on yeah. the way going back. Like when I fly to Atlanta, different I mean, story. It, it's a different story, man. People different story. Are, you know, they're all sunburned and burnt out. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with throats that. dry from running up Haleakala when exactly. they were told not to. I know the story. Yeah. $300 for a steak dinner, you know, and that's just for your bill. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, but that's pretty awesome. So talk to me a little bit about. We're going to talk about the top three problems you see in the middle class. And then we're going to talk about like maybe one or two solutions that if somebody is in your area and, and I'll, and I'll, you know, let you share a little bit about how people can get at you when we're done. But, but, but before I, let me, let me go back and talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. I used to be a college funding expert and I still am in, in a sense or another. But it's one of the things I see where the middle class, they they really want their kids to get educated. But the level of education at this point has changed drastically from what it used to be. So how do you talk to people about paying for college? And, you know, what kind of advice do you give on that? Because I think that's one of the, the big bazookas that are that are, you know, blasting at the middle class right now. That's difficult because I think college savings and and how we pay for college as a parent is hereditary 
Uh, I think if your parents paid for your college, you want to pay for your kid's college. And I think if your parents didn't pay for yours, you might want to help, but you're not going to want to pay for it all. It's just, it's hereditary. Wow. So I think that when you want to pay for it, when when I come across clients who want to pay for it, it's extremely difficult, almost religious to get yep. them to break away from that idea. Yep. Yep. And let alone the idea that maybe it'd be better for your kid to start a plumbing business and you'd okay. make way more money and have zero debt. Whoa, whoa, you know whoa. I mean? That's offensive though. What you just said is offensive to some people. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you that that right the there opposite is offensive to plumbers, you know? Right. I mean, but for <laughs> real though, I mean, I want to have this conversation with you because I ventured out of that line for my practice. I still do take people on here and there, but when I see kids come in and they, they're struggling with school and they're struggling with identity and all these different things, paying 80 grand for Stanford, even if they get in, is probably not the right thing for them. Probably not. But some parents are like, my kid got into Stanford. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Like, But should you, though? Right. Yeah. It's uh, new balance shoes cover your feet just like Louboutins, right? So <laughs> uh, I don't need, I don't really need to spend all the money on the label yeah, unless, you, anyway, unless, you're, yeah. unless you have it like that. But uh, that's yeah. a different story. But that's um, something that plagues the middle class, though. Yeah, I'd agree. All right. I would so agree. You, so basically, you just kind of tell them straight up, this is how you feel. And, and based on their, you know, based on their situation, this is what you see. And then you give them advice that's in their best interest on that. And then you let them go and chew on that. I would say that some of it's philosophical. I think that's where it has to start. Okay. And then that's the second piece of the philosophy would be, you've heard this a million times because you're in this business, but the airline, the flight attendant analogy, you know, that in the case of sudden drop of air cabin pressure, yep. oxygen mask is going to fall from the ceiling, put yep. the oxygen mask on yourself first, then your kid. Right. In other words, don't sacrifice your own retirement planning for your kid's college. It doesn't make any sense. They have plenty of time to pay for their school and their own retirement. And then from there, it gets into the you know more uh, details of you know. T- I'm not sure if Hawaii has a tax deduction on their a state tax deduction on their 529 plan, but you know we might. In Ohio, we do. So family of four, you know, two kids, two adults. They, they might have two 529 plans, but I might encourage them to get four. You know, one for the parents too, because they can transfer them to the kids without right. any penalty. Right. That way they get a $16,000 state tax deduction. Of course, $16,000 times, if you start when they're one year old, 16,000 times 18 still isn't going to pay for two kids college for your right. education anyway. So oh, well. the next question is where does the money go next? Well, the next probably for me would be just a TOD account, just a brokerage yep. account. That way it could be yep. spent on something else, yep. but I'm not wanting to tie that money up for all college because one or both of those kids might not go to school. Right, and that wouldn't be such a bad thing, and I still right. I still think it has a negative stigma on it. Um, like if you don't go to college, that's that you know you're somehow looked down upon, and it's sad that it's that way. I always joke, you know, what would happen to college? Here's a hypothetical question: What would happen to college tuition if we got rid of the loans? It would plummet. Yep, it would plummet. But, you know, but th- th- follow the money, right? So, right. Yeah. So yeah, from the, so from there, I guess it would be um, beyond philo- philosophy. It would be you know talking about the nitty gritty details of how to save for it. B plans, you know, obviously there's a little bit of a penalty, a small one, albeit to take the money out of a five twenty nine if you don't use it for college. Although I have a CPA who's a client who overfunded his five twenty nine for his daughter and ended up going and finding a qualified golf school in Florida to use it tax free. So you know, there's other places you can use the money too if right. you do by accident f- overfund it. But that really. I mean, if you're overfunding your 529, my guess is you're probably not funding your retirement enough anyway. Right, right. It's very interesting that you say that. Oh, my God. I'd, I'd love to dig deeper into that, but that's just, you know, I just wanted to put that out there because there are so many arguments about, is college, college worth it today? You know, you got Mike Rowe with this thing, and I love what Mike Rowe does. And, you know, I, I wish I, I took, I, I didn't go to college right away. I went to the military and got my GI Bill. You know, yeah, I, I went and awesome. grew up a little bit. And in foreign, thank you for your service, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Can't be said and, enough. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I became an air traffic controller, and you know, I had the brains to go to college. I just didn't want to go right out of high school. I wanted to get away from my parents. <laughs> I wanted to leave, <laughs> and uh, the military gave me a way out. But yeah, there's a lot of arguments about that. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is what are some of the the top two or three things that you see the middle class suffer with the most, like when it comes to managing their money. Mm-hmm. Let's just go with one for the sake of time, and then provide an answer as to, you know, how you rectify that in your practice. I would say the first one would just be being frivolous, just spending too much money, spending too much. enjoying life, taking the attitude to an extreme that, well, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. So 
might as well have fun. So I would say that's that's one. And I think the solution. You only live. Oh yeah, for sure. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Pop and pop the the weekend kind of thing. You know. Yeah, it's I mean, back to the shoes we just talked about, kind of mentioned as a joke, but I mean, it's it's a reality. Sometimes I think people think that, especially when money's at the forefront of their minds, or not they're not doing a good job of planning every day, every week, every month that goes by, they feel more behind, and that creates more stress and compounds over time. And then the more behind you feel, the more hopeless you feel, and the the less you feel like starting right. uh, when really you should start yesterday, you know, right. which means today, you know? and um. I think that probably the first step in remedying that problem is not to make a budget. I know that's like the, you know, that's always the the first thing people tell you, make a budget. And it's like, well, I think the first thing you should do is look back at your budget. Right. And look at what you've been spending and and open your eyes to the fact that you've been blowing twelve hundred dollars a month on DoorDash, for instance. God. And then go, man, you know, like all of a sudden you think to yourself, okay, maybe there is some more room in there to pay myself first that I didn't realize because I'm just not paying attention. I'm swiping the card and I can pay it off. And all I care about is that I can pay it off every month. Right. Right. So that would be the first one. Another one I would say is uh, buying new cars drives me crazy. I mean, (laughs) you do pretty well for yourself. I do pretty well for myself. I've never bought a new car and I will never buy a new car. I won't buy it. I won't buy a new car. And I I think that I don't, every time you buy a used car, somebody bought new, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well again that's that goes into the philosophy it's like the college <laughs> yeah. buying or leasing buying a new car leasing leasing a new car you know it all goes back to the it all goes it all goes back to the philosophy and um that's very important and one other thing i wanted to ask you that popped into my head over the last couple of days and i've been meaning to do a show on this mm. but it's about the influencer society Everybody does things nowadays because they are influenced to do so by somebody in some way or the other. Mm -hmm. Like you got the TikTok, you got all the talking heads on TV, you got like the Jim Cramers, you got like the Charles Payne show, you got like, you, you got all this stuff. And as human beings, we are consumers by nature and we love to consume every single thing, whether it's good or bad for us. How do you talk to your clients about the influencer generation and how like they're, you know, they get paid for clicks and likes and smiles and all these other crazy emojis? That's tough. I mean, that's in fact that's the hardest question you've asked this this whole this whole show because I have 12 and 9-year-old kids and I'm watching them grow up in a world that is so different from the world I grew up in as a 44-year-old, you know, I'm the, I'm the Gen X that grew up knowing how to use a phone but didn't have a phone, you right. know? So I just, I think that um, it's compounding the troubles that we have as financial professionals when you have somebody who is referred to you and you take them on as a pro bono client, you're mm-hmm. not going to charge them. You're not, they don't, they don't have any money to help anyway, Right. but they've got, they've got a car loan that they're behind on. Yeah. They've got six school loans that they're most of which are private high interest loans that are not right. deductible. Right. They've got credit cards, four credit cards that they're paying anywhere between 17 and 24% interest on. Yep. And on the third phone call, true story. Yep. On the third meeting, it was a phone appointment. They call to say, Hey, I just wanted to let you know to add to my spreadsheet. I bought this mirror that I had to, it's on layaway because it's this mirror that all the influencers have. And I'm thinking to myself, and I'm, I'm, this is not this is not my world. This is this is me in Uzbekistan trying to order coffee. I don't yeah. have a clue what she's talking about. Right. And so I Google this mirror, and it looks like a gold mirror, you know, but it's a two thousand two hundred dollar mirror that she has to have because all the influencers have it, and I don't understand it honestly. And so to answer your question, what do you say to them? The only thing I know how to do beyond giving good advice, helping people dream and and find find dreams and things to spend their money on. The only other thing I know how to do is to scare them and to show them what happens if they don't pay themselves first and if they don't save for themselves and if they continue on this this pattern of behavior that is going to end in retirement poverty. I I mean I do I wouldn't know what else to do. You know, do you want to live on social security? I don't know who does. People do. A lot of people do. But a it's your choice. 
right? A lot of so, people do. Man, I don't know. that influence, The influencer generation, that's a tough one. I feel bad for them because it's not even their fault. It's just, aren't, you it's, know, aren't we influencers? Aren't you and I both influencers as well? I don't think we're as cool, Harold. No, we're not, man. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're what you call old heads. We're, <laughs> we're old heads in this. Now, I, I love where we're going with this because... And I'm going to throw this out there to you as probably like the last thing we're going to talk about. There's this this thing that, you know, the stat, what is it? 3% of the people in the United States will retire with enough money to last them the, their entire life, but the other 97% will retire and not have enough to, to last them their entire life. Mm. We it's got a, crazy, a crazy gazillion number. financial planners. We got We got 401ks. We got like all this information on TV. And yet, we're still in the same place. Like, why do you think people retire with not enough to live on? And and almost every, not everybody, but a lot of people have 401ks. But, you know, I did a show on 401ks and why I think some of them suck because of the investment choices. But sure, what do you think it is that prevents the 3% or the 97% for, you know, like coming up and making this a closer game? Because right now this is sad. I think that it's the same reason why if you're not, somebody who scores high on the ASVAB and you know exactly what I'm talking about, Yep. you might not change your furnace filter ever and your furnace might break. Yep. You, if you're not somebody who likes cars at all, you might not ever change your oil and your, and you may, you may, your timing belt may lock up your camshaft at some point and now you got to buy a new en- engine. Yeah. I think that unfortunately, because there's still to this day are very few schools, high schools is what I mean that yeah. offer any kind of financial education to get people prepared for adulthood. And, and, and to this day, you don't have to take any in college, even if you go to college. God. I think that too many people don't understand it. They don't understand the ramifications of what happens if you don't plan. And I'm sure that you will tell, you will, you will agree with me because I, I know your answer is going to be the same in 21 and a half years. The number one, I don't want to call it a complaint, the number one wish that our clients have when I say, do you have any, do you have any regrets, anything you wish you would have done over mm-hmm. every single time? It's what I would, I wish I would have started earlier. I wish I would have started sooner. And why didn't they start earlier? Well, where, they, where they knew they were supposed to, but ago. yeah, that was my fault. Like I'll, I'll do a seminar and it's, Oh my God, this is awesome. Where were you 20 years ago? I'm like, uh, just finishing high school maybe. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't know. I, th- I think that uh, I think it just needs to. Um, there's a lot. And you're you're right. There's no shortage of financial advisors, financial planners, mm-hmm. uh, investment consultants, investment managers. But I just think people when they think most people when they think of financial planning, they think oh, I'll do that later. You know, it's uh, I don't have enough money to yeah. have a financial plan. Or you know, I know some people. Just recently talked to a couple people uh, who said they put it off because they were afraid what the answer would be. How Interesting and ironic is that, that it's almost like a self-perpetuating cycle that if you would have started earlier, it wouldn't have been a problem. But the reason you put it off is because you were afraid of what the result would be. That's crazy, insane. right? That's insane. I'm going to do so a show. I don't think there's the any shortage of opinions. Like, I don't think there's any shortage, <laughs> shortage of reasons why people don't do it or put it off. Head in the sand mentality to I'm not interested to I never thought of it. Right. Nobody ever told me. Nobody ever taught me. I think there's a lot, a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons. I'm not interested in finances. Money is evil. Yep. I've heard that Money's one before. Evil. Nice. Money's evil. Money's I'll, evil. Yeah. I'll finish on that. Money's not a root of all evil. It's a unit of choice. Exactly. And the more units you have, the more choices you have. Exactly. I, I'm sorry, man, but like, you know, you make me want to break down in tears over this because, <laughs> you know, I work hard every single day to take care of my clients. And the worst thing somebody can do other than calling me the N word. <laughs> <laughs> is to say that I'm greedy. That right. that right there is like that burnt that hurts me big it's time. It's a low blow. Yeah. And I and I and I give it everything I got every day. You know, I've dedicated my life to this. I live this stuff. I breathe this stuff. And when someone says something like that, oh, you know, money's evil. You know, it's like, wait a minute, then give me all yours or go burn it if it's evil. Yeah. You know, give I it away. Definitely don't burn it. Give it away. Things. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'll do a show later on, and maybe you can come on with me. But it's money problems. I'd love to. Or, this has been fun. Yeah, money problems versus mental problems. 
And there and that's go. going to be a heavy, heavy, heavy duty one. I need I need another specialist, a psychiatrist, or somebody to come in here and help with this because I think people suffer tremendously financially because of the the way they think, how they think about money, you know, their view on it. And so I'll I'll leave it with that. But but Adam up there in Ohio, man, I think you're doing a bang up job. I know your clients probably love you, and if they don't, they're missing out. So same to you, hero. How can they get at you? Like you know, you know the term. Like, let me, let me get our, I mean, our website's uh, libertaswealth.com. So it's okay. like liberty with an A-S at the end, libertas, it's, which is Latin for freedom, liberty, and independence. Yep. Yeah. And we're Central Ohio. Emails info at libertaswealth.com. Yep. And so uh, that information is going to be in our show notes. And so if you're in that area, I don't know how many clients you're taking on, but right now I'm kind of booked. I'm not really taking on anybody else, but, you know, but if you and your team are taking on clients, you know, Adam would be love, be, uh, be glad to have you up there. And, um, is there any particular type of client that you would prefer to work with and those that you just absolutely can't help? Like I said, we I mentioned pro bono work before. Yep. So we 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 never ever turn anybody away in terms of giving them putting them in the right direction, you know. So we we have a minimum of, of a half million dollars. We waive that minimum for people who are going to be coming into that money, whether it be through inheritance, retirement, changing jobs in the next two years. We waive that minimum for all of our clients' family members. We'll never, ever turn away a family member. Yep. And then we've been bending that rule a little bit for the obvious reasons that, you know, we've been in a bear market. Stocks have been going down since February 2021 at this point. So yep. uh, we've been bending that just a tad. But but even if they don't meet our minimum, we always give them our time for free, right. answer questions. I always say you never have to be a client to ask a question. Right. And what I love what you're saying is because you invest your time back into people. I mean, I know you probably do very well. You make a lot of money and your time is extremely valuable. You're probably at like $3,000 an hour or something crazy like that. Like, you know, we do well, but we also invest back into people. And right. I try to do what I wish to God somebody would have did for me. Like I was just broke, stupid person. And then, you know, when I sought help, they never gave me the right advice. It was always something crazy. So I appreciate what you're doing up there, man. And that's why I want to give you a big shout out. So Adam, Coach, thank you, you sir, for it. being on you my show it. today. Thank you. And until next time, everybody, one, two, three, let's get it. This is the podcastfactory.com.